Sorry about the, we were delayed with some technical difficulties. I'd like to welcome you to today's event sponsored by the Wilmington Library. We have a very distinguished um, panel of um, prominent um, African-American male children uh, authors. Um, a very special gentleman will be moderating the conversation. It's Mr. Alvin Irvy. Uh, Alvin is a, is a Renaissance man. He's a comedian, he's an author, he's an e educator. Um, he's been on TED Talks, um, and he's been at, he's been to Wilmington Public Library numerous times. So we're delighted to have him with us. So at this time, I'll just turn the conversation over to Mr. Irby. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Jamar. Uh, I want to first start by just thanking the Wilmington Public Library for organizing this event and uh, giving us an opportunity to bring together all these amazing uh, authors and illustrators. Uh, to talk about their work uh, and about, about writing uh, for children. So uh, we're going to start by uh, kind of giving each of the authors and illustrators an opportunity uh, to kind of talk a little bit about who they are um, in case any of you uh, are unfamiliar with them and their work. And so um, we're going to start uh, with uh, Gordon James, um, who uh, is an amazing uh, illustrator who has done uh, amazing work on several award-winning books. Um, and so, uh, Gordon, uh, you can go ahead uh, and start, uh, share with the people a little bit about yourself and your work. Well, um, my name is uh, Gordon C. James, and uh, I'm a fine artist and illustrator. And oddly enough, I haven't done several award-winning books. I did one book that won a lot of awards. <laughs> and so, um, and that book is um, Crown and Oats of the Fresh Cut I, all, with, uh, author, with Derek Barnes. And I also illustrated the Scraps of Time series with Patricia McKissack, um, Letter Buck with Vonda Michelle Melson. And right now, um, our current book, the current book that I have out with Derek Barnes is the New York Times bestselling, I Am Every Good Thing. And I live here in Charlotte, North Carolina with uh, my wife, Ingrid, and my children, Astrid and Gabe, and our dog, Rascal. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gordon. We look forward to uh, learning more about you uh, as we continue the conversation. Um, the next person I would like to introduce you to uh, is Don uh, Tate. Uh, also uh, an amazing uh, author. Don, feel free to share uh, a little bit about yourself and your work. All right, well, I wanna thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this conversation tonight. I'm honored um, to be here and I'm a big fan of each and every person here on the panel. Um, again, my name is Don Tate and I am primarily an illustrator um, from Des Moines, Iowa. Yes, there are black folks in Iowa, believe it or not. Um, but I've illustrated 80 plus trade and educational books over my um, 30 plus career. And so I began illustrating on the educational side. And I often, I always include those books in my book count because they are books. I'm demonstrating a, a story and a character through, through 32 pages. Um, I currently live in Austin, Texas. Um, I started writing in 2010. Um, I had been afraid to write for so many years because I thought writing was for people who were much smarter than me. And then once I started writing, I discovered that I loved writing just as much as I love illustrating. And um, my newest book is called William Still and His Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad and Swish. And it's a long title, The Slam Dunking, Alley Ooping, High Flying Harlem Globetrotters. And so those books published um, in November and I'm really excited to, um, to be here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Don. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Varian Johnson, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit about himself. Sure. Again, uh, like Don said, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to pause first and do Gordon the favor since, you know, he doesn't have his books up there for him. I'm going to hold his up right here for him real quick. Uh, oh, <laughs> crown, oh, crown, oh, to the fresh cut. And I am every good thing. Um, thank you. With Derek Barnes as well. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful books. Um, I am an author of books for children and young adults. Um, I'm known for works such as uh, The Great Green Heist and also The Parker Inheritance, which I was fortunate to have been awarded a Coretta Scott King honor for that book among some other uh, accolades. And my newest book is called Twins. It's a graphic novel illustrated by the phenomenal Shannon Wright about 
twin sisters who are starting middle school and who are trying to figure out who they are apart from each other. And this is Twins Here. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Varian. Uh, and uh, next we have uh, Jerry Kraft. Uh, Jerry, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, I'm going to start also by talking about Gordon, because Gordon, <laughs> I have a good thing. Didn't I just win the Kirkus Prize? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sure. have you not done multiple award-winning books now? I, I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, okay. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Jesus, Thank you. you always teach us to be so humble, you know? <laughs> That's right. what it Multiple is. Multiple award-winning illustrator, <laughs> young man. Okay. <laughs> All right, so my name is Jerry Kraft, and I am the author and illustrator of the graphic novel New Kid, which is the first graphic novel ever to win the Newbery Medal. And it also won, I also won the Coretta Scott King Author Award. And that came out last year, February of 2019. And earlier this year, um, I had the companion book release in October of this year, which is Class Act, which is the companion book and follow up. And um, I was fortunate enough to have both of these uh, for one month being the number one and number two best-selling in the graphic novels for the New York Times. So that was quite the honor in an otherwise very strange 2020. So glad to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I wanna just thank all of our distinguished guests for uh, being available to be a part of this conversation. Um, I wanna start um, today by talking a little bit about how the world, uh, current events um, impact your work. You know, we're living through a historic time, historic time of protests, of a global pandemic, uh, social unrest, uh, and the list kind of goes on and on, financial uh, uh, challenges. And so as I think about all these things going on, um, I'm curious about kind of to what extent do you are is your work influenced by what's happening in the here and now or, or even in the recent past or in thinking about where things are heading and so um, I would love to maybe um, start um, with um, Varian uh, if you could uh, maybe share a little bit of, about kind of how the world and, and, and current events and life and things influence your work? Yeah, it, it influences a lot. I think um, as an author, I find it very hard sometimes to write about current events when we're right in them um, because we don't know how they're going to end. But I do think it gives us an opportunity to allude to past events and to use the past to kind of shape books that we're talking about in the present. And I find that on some of the current works I'm working on that, that works as well. But also I, I find that it's, it, you know, we've all been at home. None of us have been doing any in-person school visits, but I imagine most of us have been doing virtual school visits. I, I surely have been. And I find that they've taken even a, a more important purpose at this point um, to connect with young readers, to give them, uh, encourage them to keep reading and to keep writing that there's truth and there's power in their writing. But also just, again, dealing with so much of the social unrest, um, I think it's so, so important for them to see people of color, uh, especially black people, black men, um, speaking about books, talking about different avenues. I, I think the, the media sometimes uh, only shows a limited perspective of who we can be. Um, that's why I love this panel today. We have all these uh, amazing creators from these all these different backgrounds. And I think young people have to see that. And we it is part of maybe not our job, but it's, a, it's an added bonus of going and making sure young people see us doing what we do. Um, I, I agree 100 percent. And, you know, one of the great things about school visits is that, you know, you're at a single school, but you know, you may have an opportunity to speak to the entire school or multiple classrooms. And so a single visit could, you know, potentially impact lots of different lives. And that's the kind of, in many ways, uh, exactly what books do, right? You don't have to be there yourself to have uh, an impact on those who get a chance to interact with it. Um, 
I, I want to go next to uh, Don. You know, as I look at a lot of the titles uh, and read many of the titles that you've written about, many of them uh, deal uh, with biographies or historical uh, context. And so um, Don and, you know, selecting which books you illustrate and why you want to illustrate certain books or write certain books, I would love to, to hear from you a little bit about this question of how, you know, the current moment, whether it's the current moment we're in or even, you know, past moments uh, that influence your work, uh, how that kind of worked for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's one that I thought about quite a bit last year, um, you know, after the killings of several unarmed black men and then all of the protests that started you know, and I, I believe in Minneapolis and then stretched out throughout, throughout the world. And I kept wondering, you know, because my black friends were out on the streets, you know, protesting and my white friends were out there and, you know, everything like everyone was out there and I was at home sitting here in my studio hiding because of the coronavirus. And so I kind of felt like, you know, I wasn't doing my part. And so what I just ended up doing what I normally do. I, I, I wrote a new book and I continued illustrating my books and I came to the realization that you know, I am doing, I am, I am doing the important work. My stories highlight the lives of um, little known African American historical figures who have overcome great obstacles. And so my books serve as weapons in this, in this, in this war um, of social justice. Um, and then, you know, my books also offer a path for children trying to understand how to navigate this conversation. Um, I think about figures like um, George Moses Horton, who was an enslaved poet, and he used his words to protest his slavery. And while he never did actually find freedom during slavery, um, he was able to live practically as a free Black man um, by, by, by selling his poetry. So my, my books offer um, examples of African-American um, heroes who have overcome you know, great obstacles. Um, some of the same obstacles that we're facing today, you know, many, oftentimes, you know, people are, you know, parents are having these conversations at home with their kids about like the Confederate monuments, you know, and kids are asking questions. What is this conversation about the Confederate monuments? What is, what's, what's behind that? Well, my, my book, um, The Amazing Age of John Roy Lynch offers a historical perspective. Um, and so kids can study these stories and they can learn how to navigate, you know, moving forward. I've, I've, at, when I taught kindergarten and first grade, um, one of the things I thought a lot about in choosing books for my read-alouds, which I did often uh, at least once a day, but sometimes, you know, I would, I would you know, be lucky enough to read two books a day. Um, but one of the things I thought a lot about was that, you know, in the time in which we're living, so many um, parents may feel a need to kind of protect their kids from any feelings, negative feelings, you know, and in life, as you all know, bad things are going to happen. You're going to encounter negative situations. And what I found that uh, was really important for so many of the children and the students was having a caring adult present to help them process. And as I thought about and selected children's books, Oftentimes, I thought about, you know, what can this book help me to help my students to gain a better understanding of, either out in the world or themselves. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I was thinking about as I was uh, looking at um, many of the titles, uh, Barry, and that, that you have, um, you know, you've written uh, for a wide range of kind of audiences. And so, um, you know, uh, I know that, you know, when you, when you write for maybe YA, uh, you know, it, there may be look, things that you can maybe go more in depth with than maybe when you, you're writing for, for very young children. And so, um, you know, maybe Jerry or, or, or Vary, and I would love to hear from you guys about uh, navigating or, 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 you know, writing or illustrating for you know, YA or, or, or you know, or, or writing for the, the older kids and then writing for the very young children, kind of how you ha have been able to think about and navigate, um, you know, social issues. 
You know, it's interesting that for some reason, I have always been kind of drawn to kind of weighty issues. You know, when I start out doing a Mama's Voice comic strip, um, I had tackled subjects such as, you know, diabetes and, you know, teen pregnancy and AIDS prevention and things like that. And then more and more people started coming to me and asking me to do things for them along those same lines. So uh, there's a, probably half the books I have done have had some kind of, you know, issue to them. And so when I sat down to, to do New Kid, um, it was pretty normal ground for me to take something as complicated as race and, and in class act, it's more about class and classism and take that and then find some humor to it so that it's not, you know, standing up on a soapbox preaching. It's more like having that conversation, like you were saying, having an adult present. And I think with the, the protests that happened all year, um, there were so many teachers and moms and dads, you know, looking for ways to, uh, you know, broach the subject with their kids. And I think as a result, that really, I mean, the, the timing, it's unfortunate that those things happen, but for me personally to have my book out there and, and so many people had done like, you know, anti-racism, um, you know, like book lists and, and book clubs and things like that. So it was just kind of an honor to, to have a book that so many of them chose that could help them um, you know, use the words to express their feelings. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Gordon, I want to go to you next. And, you know, one of the things that I, I thought a lot about as I've, I've looked at your work and, and you know, um, I was inspired by uh, when Crown first came out um, to write a blog um, for Barbershop Books, you know, about uh, your book. Um, um, and not just you know, of course, because of the connection uh, to the barbershop, but also um, because of the illustrations, you know, not every child has been to a museum. You know, not every kid even knows what impressionism is, you know, or what that means. But, you know, your, your, your illustrations to me, not only does it almost transport you to a museum, but it also transports you to moments and people that you identify with, or at least that's what it did for me. And um, as I think about, you know, our society and, and what's going on, I'm curious, um, Gordon, to learn about kind of how you kind of see those things or if you see those things kind of playing out in your, your illustrations and your art. Well, I'm a traditional oil painting painter, excuse me. So some of you guys, you probably see uh, the portrait of my niece um, behind me. And I try to bring that to my books. Um, and and what it's one of the things that inspired me to do that is uh, one weekend I was in New York, we were visiting family. And so we took the kids to the MoMA and they were having a show about toys. And so the kids liked the show about toys. And then um, the next day we went down to the Met and they were having a John Singer Sargent rep, uh, retrospective. And he's probably, you know, the greatest American portrait painter ever. And I was shocked as to the fact that my children really enjoyed the Sargent show more than the, um, than the toy exhibit, which was really designed for them. And so mm -hmm. um, that really uh, reinforced the fact, you know, the, the method in which the, the method in which I work. So, you know, uh, I, I don't have a ton of books out, but I've been illustrating for a while. And I had about an eight year drought where nobody hired me because it was said that my style was not relatable for children. Maybe it should be a little simpler, maybe flat vector based art. And, you know, taking my kids to that show made me see that, you know, I don't have to change what I'm doing. Children are very, very sophisticated. And they can they can enjoy art like the, like the, like like that of that's in Varian's book or Don's books or Jerry's books and what I do. And you don't have to, you know, children 
they can they can take a, a variety of things in and you don't have to you just have to put them in it and they're happy and how you <laughs> give it to them that's pretty much up to you can i can i add on real quick because sure. i want to say that that's that's kind of the danger that's been that was prevalent in our industry for so long the idea that there's this single look the single book the single topic that we as uh, Black authors could talk about. And it was very limiting and very funneling. And this kind of was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, well, of course people don't buy these books. Well, because you don't publish those books. Um, but now, we, you know, we have, we have a, kids of color deserve to see themselves in all forms of books just as much as any other kid, just as much as a white kid or, or whatever, right? And, and, and I love that we have this diversity of looks and this diversity of stories too. Um, so a reader can find something that, that, that brings them joy in one way and it makes them think and perhaps in another book and it makes them laugh or, or even all combined together. We just want the same opportunities that our contemporaries have to create the books that we think will bring meaning and joy to the world and ourselves. One yeah, of the things that you, that, oh wait, someone was saying something, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say that I had, I had the same experience when I got into publishing back in the eighties. I've always liked to do stylized art and to play with different looks. And I had a hard time breaking into the industry because publishers were telling me that if I was going to illustrate African-Americans, I had to illustrate them in a portraiture. Right? They had to be very realistic. And while I felt comfortable painting that way, that's not what made me happy as an artist. So I had to uh, play around with a lot of different, well, and for a while I did, I painted you know, very, very realistically. Um, thankfully things have changed and it always bothered me when I walked into the bookstores, like back in the eighties, books with white characters and bumblebees and cars, they were all different styles and, uh, and looks of illustrations. But to me, the African-American books all looked the same, very portraiture. Uh, and so I'm glad now that there is more of a variety of artwork because kids can appreciate, kids appreciate different styles of artwork. You know, one of the things, uh, thank you uh, very much, Don, uh, for that, that idea. Um, one of the things that, Gordon, your, your statement made me think about um, was the response of the children and how their response in, way, in a way gave you a green light to, to, to do something or to continue doing something. And it makes me think about, um, um, you know, uh, the children's book, you know, that I wrote, Gross Greg, um, it's about a kid who loves to eat boogers, right? Um, you call them boogers, he calls them delicious little sugars. Now, you know, of course, I pitched it to lots of people and they were like, you know, that's nice, but rhyming books are hard or a book about boogers, uh, I don't know. And, you know, I remember um, saying, you know what, let me just send the manuscript to a few kindergarten and first grade teachers that I know. And let me see what they have to say about it. And when I asked them, they said, Alvin, the kids were rolling on the floor and they were slapping their knees. And I said to myself, you know what? That's all I need. That's who I'm writing for. And I know that when you're, when you're working with publishers, there's a lot. And when you're working with a large publisher, there's a lot more stuff that plays into it, right? It's not just only you and what you want. There are a lot of other people who are investing in, in things. But I would love to hear... Um, from any of you about how you've kind of been able to navigate that that fine line of like the things that you're like, you know what, this is something that is a non-negotiable for me, or this is something that I really feel strongly about and how you've been able to kind of push forward with those things that have, um, you know, really been important to you. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll go to Jerry. I know Jerry, you know, you've been drawing and, and writing like many of you for a very long time um and then anyone else who wants to kind of chime in on that but i would love to hear about i guess just the persistence and the kind of stick with itness that's required uh to be able to do this work yeah you know with me it's it's so funny because a lot of times people when they hear new kid they think like you know i'm a debut author 
<laughs> and like, you know, just kind of came out of nowhere. And uh, I got to do this just because you asked. But uh, I like self published. I self published my first book in 1997, based on my comic strip. So 1997. And since 1997, as far as like self publishing, I've done like about three dozen books, you know. And because literally in 97, when I sent this book out, I got such like nasty, like handwritten responses from editors. I'm like, dude, who takes time to like, write a handwritten? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the form letter's okay, but when they stop and they write something on the bottom, and it, it's like, I mean, it really was soul crushing. And I, back then in 97, said, I'm not going to even try to um, be traditionally published anymore. So I, work with other authors and I illustrate their books and self publish them. And then it literally wasn't until 2014 when uh, I got an email from Andre Pinckney from Scholastic asking if I wanted to illustrate a book. And I almost thought that's, that someone was pranking me. You know, it's like, so I did the um, Zero Degree Zombie Zone, which I illustrated. And then once I did that and I started going around and seeing like the different events and book fairs. I was like, wow, you know, maybe it is time that, you know, things are opening up, you know, and I started meeting people. I remember having lunch with Don Tate and kind of picking his brain and then seeing that maybe, you know, it is kind of time where I can try it again. And then that's when I literally 2014 uh, was when I started pitching New Kid. And it just kind of took off, but it was like literally like 30 years of Yeah, it's, it's interesting how a lot of people will see um, the finished or final product of something, but they don't see the years or decades that preceded, you know, what, 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 what may be getting a, a lot of attention. Um, um, Don or, or, or Varian, would you, would you like to... Uh, comment on, on, on that idea of pressing forward in spite of, uh, you know, criticism? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. I think, um, I think there's something that every author has to go through. Um, you know, in, in some ways, it's probably something every person has to go through, um, no matter what their career is. Um, I, I, when I do school business, I like to tell students oftentimes of how I failed and how I thought I was going to quit. You know, I published. I published traditionally. My books didn't sell. I had canceled contracts. I thought that, you know, uh, you know, I had a nice little thing there. I wrote some books, you know, a handful of people read them. Um, and then I was going to go back to being an engineer. I was a civil engineer and I, I'm doing good at that job, doing well at it. Um, but I think for most people who are trying to create something, you have to have it in yourself. You have to be stubborn enough to stick with it and keep moving forward. And you also have to think about reinventing yourself and like, I think about this a couple of ways. I think about all of us on this panel and thinking about how we came to um, the books that we're best known for, let's say how we took a chance with those. Where, you know, I think about, uh, Don, when I think about you, I think about It Just Happened, and like, that's the first book you wrote, right? Yes. Yes, right, and like taking a chance on not just, not just illustrating, but writing them as well. Uh, and I know Gordon, I know Derek reached out to you about um, Ode, uh, crown right and and jerry saying with you with taking a chance with with doing something different with new kid i think you got to be brave enough to try something different and believe in yourself and that is hard to do and it is very helpful you have other people cheering you on um but you got to have enough belief that you can try and if you fail you fail you figure things out and you you try again um no I, one I, of the Oh, yeah, no, go I'd ahead. Like to, I'd like to add to that because, um, you know, I think that there's this weird balance that we navigate. Like, um, and so when I came out of art school, I wasn't the most confident guy. So uh, I was living in New York. I got out of school. I um, got out of school of visual arts and I only dropped off my portfolio once. And that was to work at Hallmark and they hired me. Right. So maybe if I had dropped off my portfolio around the city, I would have gotten freelance gigs and I wouldn't have had to move to Missouri to start my, my job. And then there's this thing where like, I was always afraid of the rejection. 
And that now, like I've learned, like if you don't like something that I've done, I really try my best to um, listen to your criticism, decide, because you know, not a lot of criticism is very valid and you need it so that you can learn and you can grow. But by the same token, you cannot let it crush you. And if there are any kids watching, I want them to know that the first time I did a book, like I failed, I completely failed. Um, the contract got pulled, they gave the book to somebody else. And, but I, I learned about the process. And even after that, I was completely confident that if I had a chance to do it again, I would be more communicative. And because it wasn't about the quality of my work, it's like I got stuck and I was scared to ask for help. And I was scared to tell people what it was I didn't know or, or find the answers to my questions. And so at that point, from now on, if I ever hit a snag, I, I call my agent, I call an editor, and we just keep moving forward. And so, you know, don't worry about failing. Don't worry about hitting road bump, road, don't worry about hitting bumps in the road. And I will tell you all throughout life, all throughout your careers, all throughout your school, you're going to get to those points where things get tough and you'll want to quit with the pandemic, with the newfound <laughs> success of my recent project. It's been a lot of pressure. It's been a lot of stress. And every once in a while I get that, man, I just want to go back, teach a drawing class and just, you know what I mean? That was huh. a good life I had. Chill it, then, chill right? it. But if you just kind of rest in it, give it a few days, all of a sudden it kind of fades and you get used to this as your new normal and, and you, you, you move forward. But, you know, I have to say that one of the problems that I think we all face is when you are pitching ideas to an editorial staff, that does not look like us and does not have the memories that we do, they don't feel that same kind of compassion to those stories. So you may say, hey, I have this idea about this and me and Don are like, oh man, that's perfect. But you know, the publishing industry by large is primarily white. And again, they did not have those shared experiences. So they may be like, no, nah, no one's gonna want that. You know, Who's gonna want a book about a boy going to get his hair cut? You know, or right. when African American girls running for a class president, or who cares about who did the super soaker, or you know, what I mean, like that kind of thing. So it can be very difficult. You know, um, I, I wanted to say that I've done a lot of books, like I do a lot of history books, right? And um, and and then I do like the more uplifting, inspirational books that I've done with Derek. And there are just sometimes I go, I love. A manuscript came across my 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 desk about this like a boy and his dog you know what i mean like i was a black boy i had a dog i love my dog you know what i mean like sometimes it can just be that simple you know like like our kids are having all these same experiences that other kids have and i'd love to illustrate those stories too well and i think that's a great segue into the, the next thing I want to talk about, you know, as I've thought a lot about kind of um, how children's literature is evolving in terms of the topics and the content, you know, when I was a kindergarten teacher, you know, what actually inspired me to even want to publish a book was, you know, I've been a stand-up comedian for 11 years, right, performing at comedy clubs, colleges all over the country, and as a kindergarten first grade teacher, you know, at, I kept getting recommendations for books that kind of were based around oppression narratives, right? Which is, you know, it, it has a historical context that's important, but it's not the only narrative, right? And as a stand-up comedian and as a kindergarten and first grade teacher, I just kept thinking black boys, black girls, kids want to laugh too. Like they, they don't only want to read about struggle. And so I just was like, and I'm a comedian. So here I am going out on, at night after work, making people laugh, but then coming back into the classroom and having such a limited kind of uh, menu of, of books to choose from. And so I guess one of the things that I've, I've been looking, thinking about is like, it seems like we're moving a little bit away from some of the more oppression narratives into an affirmation narrative phase. But even in the affirmation narrative, one of the things that I think about is uh, a quote by Frantz Fanon. Now, uh, for anyone who, who's never heard of Frantz Fanon, he was a black um, a psychologist um, in Algeria. 
treating black and white uh, soldiers when they were Algeria was fighting for their independence from France. And in his book, Black Skin, White Mask, what he said was that uh, this idea of Negro, uh, Negrophilia, loving the Negro, can be just as problematic as Negrophobia, hating the Negro, because they both objectify uh, Black people in terms of their Blackness. So people don't hate you because you're a bad person. They hate your Blackness. And, and likewise, they don't like you because you know of who you are, but because of your Blackness. And so I wonder, as I think about children's literature, you know, are, are, are Black children being trapped in their Blackness and not allowed to, you know, experience those books about just a kid with a dog or some of these kind of more individual narratives? And so I would love to hear about some of your experiences in, in thinking about these kind of ideas of identity and how they kind of play out in children's literature or YA as well. Um, I, I'll start. I'll start. I I think so. Like we're like at I like to say we're at diversity and inclusion 2.0, maybe 2.5, where we've gone from you know only being a select number of authors, a select number of books, to that widening and widening, and we're getting better and better. So let's take picture books and board books. Like we've come such a long way with the stories that not only are being told, but like who is telling the story, which is just important. You know, the people behind the stories being people of color, being um, black artists, black authors as well too. And that wasn't necessarily the case 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. Um, but obviously we have uh, uh, further to go. I will say I have a six year old and a nine year old and my six year old, um, like now I gotta get your book, uh, Alvin, because like my six-year-old loves funny books. She adores funny books, but we are so frustrated that I am so frustrated that we can't find enough funny books um, featuring um, kids of color and, and written by people of color even. And it's a, it's a, it's a whole, it's something that we, we have to work on. Um, you know, we just read um, the the biggest bed, the honest bed. Oh gosh, I am blanking on the title now, which is hilarious. But like I had to do a Twitter search to find that book. We're doing better on that. We're seeing a diversity of books in, in other areas. Um, in picture books, it, it, we still have a little ways to go. In graphic novels, we, we still have a little ways to go too um, of, of, say, uh, of showing a, a multitude of people. And again, I just want to emphasize that doesn't mean that we don't need all these other books as well too we just need a wide variety again exactly I keep saying, it, it's not about Go ahead. a single narrative it's about multiple narratives and that's something i definitely want to communicate is that my comments were not meant to somehow say that certain types of books shouldn't be published uh it you know a single narrative sh there shouldn't be a single narrative and i i agree i agree with that would anyone else like to hop in on on that idea uh of of narratives or or anything related to that i would just wanted to say that um i agree that we need a wide variety of narratives i love the historical books that i've done but i off i sometimes wonder if um you know sometimes when some when you overcome something right um like george fletcher in the book i did letter buck which actually did win a western literature award so that, that would be another one. So go figure. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, when he, he overcomes in, injustice in his rodeo career, you know? And so, like, when you overcome injustice in the world, the, the flip side of that is that somebody was doing something to you in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I want kids, while I feel it's very important that his story and other stories like his be told, I also, there also have to be other books out there so that um, young black kids don't feel like that. It is their role to have to go through the injustice to get to where they have to be. You know what I mean? That like it, while it may be a part of your life and it's probably likely it'll be a part of, of, of your life if you're African-American in this world, it should not have to be a part of your life. Or if you're someplace where you're experiencing the injustice, you don't have to sit there. Sometimes you sit there and you wanna fight through it and you wanna change. And sometimes you can be like, you people don't deserve me. 
I'm moving on to a different situation, <laughs> right? There's there like you go. ways to handle that. And I, and I, 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 I think that that balance in that books will, will make things, will, will, will help to make sure that kids don't feel like they have to be the, that, that, that's not their role. Do you, you, you guys understand what I'm saying? Like that role. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. and it's, you, there is a real impact in the classroom. I remember a kid, I read a, a book about Martin Luther King not during February. And, um, you know, one of the kids who was a Latino, it was in the Bronx. I was teaching first grade in the Bronx. And, you know, he ran up to me weeping in the classroom, just crying. And I'm like, oh no, did someone hit you? Like, what going on? He said, they keep calling me Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They keep, because he was dark skinned. And so I, I guess I just read a book about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the kid somehow had turned it into an insult or he was interpreting it as an insult to be called Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he just made me think like, wow, like, Kids can sometimes be experiencing something that we as adults are trying to create that's different from what our intentions, you know, are. Um, well, can I add one, I more, think, one thing? Oh, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I, I, I do not want to miss the opportunity to talk about uh, Whoosh um, that Don yeah. illustrated, written by Chris Barton. And, like, my, my kids love that book. My brother's kids love that book. Um, and it's interesting, like, they know that I'm an engineer and he's an engineer as well, too. But, like, we're not an engineer that created something famous. But, like, they know what the super soaker is. And, like, every time there's this great spread where it goes whoosh and it folds out. And, like, they love that and they get so much enjoyment from it. And I think that's kind of what I think about when I think about fun and enjoyment. We, everyone finds entertainment in different things we just need the variety of it but like for my girls like whoosh is it like and and you know also they want to be you know rich right too that doesn't hurt <laughs> yeah i just think that there's there's plenty of room on the market for for all of the above and one of the things that i hope i mean we need the books on you know that boost children's self-esteem we need the haircut books we need the don't touch my hair books but i hope that and sometimes I feel that there's a bit of a pushback against the history books and I totally get it but I I believe that history is important and when I was a kid I was uh I was not a big reader and I remember in English literature classes in high school we were assigned to read like Edgar Allan Poe and, and, and Steinbeck and um you know all the great classics and none of those books ever spoke to me and it wasn't until I came across the book Black Boy by Richard Wright which had a historical slant I fell in love with 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 the literature. I fell in love with reading, and so I think that you know, hist I think that history books are important, and I just think that there needs to be room on the market for, like I say, all of the above. So, uh, I agree. I agree one hundred percent. And that's, I mean, I think you know, that's often what we want. We just want to be able to do what everyone else is doing, right? When you go into a bookstore, you see books that feature, you know, white children that where they're doing all kinds of things. And there's no questions about why is this kid being represented in this way? Because it's, it's kind of a, a default or a given that that kid is, is, is only representing themselves, right? They're not meant to somehow, this one book isn't meant to represent an entire kind of group of people. Um, before, uh, you know, we kind of move on to, to something else. One of the things that I'm curious about, since I have creatives uh, on the panel, I want to hear about your creative process. You know, like, like literally, how do you uh, create, um, you know, for me, you know, being a stand-up comedian, uh, I got used to always writing down ideas, right? So yesterday, after or this morning when I heard that, you know, they had finally finished everything with, with Biden and, and Kamala, you know, I just got this idea of Kamala walking through the White House burning sage, right? And so I wrote, I wrote that down, like, let, let, me, let me write that down. That has potential. Um, but I would love to hear about your, your various processes. And Don, you can go ahead and maybe start there, but how do you create? What is your process? How do you do that? 
So as an author illustrator, and it, you know, it varies from, from illustrator to illustrator, but for me, I have to begin with the words. Um, I've always been a commercial artist, so I have to have a, a purpose. So I begin with the words and I write a manuscript and I write a very bad manuscript and that's okay. I, I, I love the revision process and that's where I molded it, molded it into a better manuscript. And sometimes I will revise that manuscript 40, 50 times before I even share it with my, with my agent who then once it sells, then there's even more, um, there's even more revision. Um, but then I will start the sketching process and that totally throws all of my writing out the window um, because I write picture books. Um, mm. Oftentimes I'll discover where I don't have to use certain words in the manuscript because I can illustrate those words. And I should have been thinking about that before I got to that point, but I didn't. And so then I go in and I revise the, the manuscript and now that affects the illustrations. And so I kind of do this dance back and forth between the illustrations and the text. And I pretty much take that up until right until the book goes out to the publisher. I'm illustrating the book right now about um, football player Ernie Barnes is going to print in two weeks. And I'm still in there <laughs> tweaking the words to this day. Um, and I often find even after the book publishes and I'm standing before an audience of children and I'm reading the words and I'm not even reading the words in the book. I'm reading the words that I think sound better now that I'm revising them <laughs> in my head. So the revision process continues. So that's, that's kind of my process. Thank you, thank you. I think that's important to know. You know, I think children, adults are on the receiving end of, of, of your art and, and the other authors and illustrators. And, and I think it's, it's important to understand some of the process. Um, uh, Gordon, uh, I would love to hear about your process as an artist um, and as an as a as an illustrator, children's book illustrator. So, so when I do my own paintings, they basically start with an idea. I have a I'm in my sketchbook. I'm doing all these tiny little drawings, and I just when I have ideas, I just start, you know, just doing all these little drawings, and then I'll hire a model to be that that thing, you know, that 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 I that I need for them to be. When I'm doing my um, illustrations, it generally starts with the words. I'll get a I'll get a manuscript and I'll print it out, you know, and I'll just sit there and I'll read it and I'll draw all over the manuscript. And then I will then I'll do my little thumbnails and I'll probably do five, 10, 15 for a page. And I actually hire models. I'll do like a Facebook call and IG uh, an IG model call and I'll hire models and I'll take photos and so like in these books, most of the kids that are front and center are actual kids that live here in the Concord area. And, and I will work from a lot of that, uh, a lot of that photo reference. And then, you know, there's the drawing stage and we submit the drawings. And if they approve the drawings, then I get to move on and I get to paint. And um, that is basically my 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 process you know even if i'm doing i'm doing a book now um about andrew young and how he was inspired by jesse owens called just like jesse and it's written by his daughter paula paula shelton young and so i had to find a kid to kind of play a young andrew young and um i kind of cast the book like people would cast a movie and i had no idea i, I mean i know i've seen pictures associated with some of the, like just on social media, like, oh, this is the kid that inspired. But I had no idea your process involved this kind of casting. And, and I feel, how affirming is that for children to know? I think it is very cool that there are, especially if a book like I Am Every Good Thing, which doesn't have one main character, you talked about trying to illustrate a people. You know what I mean? And so like, and I'm every good thing. You've got kids that live in the city. You've got kids in the country. You've got tall kids, short kids, chubby kids, you know, kids swimming, kids that are interested in science. I wanted kids to be able to see themselves. And so that was an opportunity for a lot of kids to be, um, to a lot of kids, for a lot of kids to be a part of that book. And so I just love the idea that, you know, this kid will grow up and you know it's like if you do a good great if you if you do a great job you get to leave a little something and so what's really neat is i know that um i think i'm every good thing is going to be around and so that kid that was in that book can be reading that book to his kid and be like yeah that's your daddy that's me right there and i think that that is 
I think that that is um, very, very cool. But that being said, I want to hear what how Jerry does his work because um, my 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 wife liked that book like like love new kid. My daughter goes to a private school. She loves new kid. My niece who is watching because I can see that my mother's on. She <laughs> loved new kid. So I'm just like, how'd you do that that book that like um. Sorry, Alvin, doing your job. Uh, <laughs> no, you you were going where I was going to go. So you, you know, it's just that you read my brain. That's all. That's all. Yeah, I'm just like, how'd you do that book that touched so many people and, you know, won a Newberry? You know, that's never been done. So, so like, let, let, let's hear that. <laughs> well, you know, what's so funny is I wasn't a reader as a kid. So because I wasn't a reader, I didn't consider myself a writer until I was an adult. I just always considered myself an artist. Like, and I would write my own stories, but I was like, yeah, I'm an artist. Um, so when I, you know, I, at 12 or 13, I never thought I would read the 250 page book. I really never thought I would end up writing one. So when I start out with New Kid in Class Act, I draw my little story arc and say, you know, this is where I'm starting, this is where I'm ending, and I want these little things to go. And then I just go right into, I took one of my son's old binders, you know, and this is like one of the old, uh, you know, notebook binders, and I just start going in and sketching, and because I can't go but so long without drawing, you know. So real quick, if we're out somewhere and Jerry leaves that unattended on a table, <laughs> We need to steal it, right? <laughs> and then they up on eBay, Jerry, right? <laughs> but yeah, you know. And then from there, it's the writing and the rewriting. And, and Alvin, since you're a, a stand-up comic, you know you got to go back in and put the jokes in. And how do you say this funnier? And and trim the funnier. fat. Trim the fat. Yep. Yeah. And I think because I did comic strips for so long, I was always used to panel panel joke panel panel joke so wow. that hasn't changed now that i'm doing the longer form comics so i try to get as many jokes in there especially like my responsibility of i know that i'm dealing with uh african-american characters and i see someone had asked about doing african-american characters i do all of my books star african-american characters i do have other you know, like in this private school, but primarily the main protagonists are African-American because there's so few books that have that, you know. And then I think that a book that features African-American characters and talks about race and class can be seen as very heavy and scary for some people. So that's why I, I shove as much humor in it as possible to make it more like you know, medicine that's in a... Palatable, got right, you. Right, you take your medicine and you put it inside a, a Mentos or a... a so Oreo story arc, sketching, 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 revision, revision, revision. Revision, 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 absolutely. Um, uh, Varian, uh, could you talk a little bit about your process? Uh, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's not that different for everyone else. Lots of revision. Um, I usually come up with a, an idea, and I'm thinking about the best way to say that. I think about plot two, and I think about, not to get, like, super nerdy, but, like, I think about, like, what does a character want, and why do they want that thing, and what happens if they don't get that thing, and what's stopping them to get from getting that thing, and, like, what do they want versus what they need. There are all these things and kind of questions that I'm asking myself as I kind of take notes on a story, and I will take notes for days, months, sometimes even years. The Park Inheritance existed as little notes and ideas for eight years before I started on that book. Um, and then I start the process of revising and revising and revising. And I just go through a lot of, I go through a lot of revisions, but also I feel like, you know, when it comes to revision, you can't set yourself up for failure. I think often we will self-sabotage ourselves. We will um, self um, censor ourselves, saying, well, this won't work, This can't, I can't do this, I can't do that. And I'm like, that first draft is where we should try everything. We should really explore. And then, again, you go back, you cut the fat, you fix it. Rewriting, uh, revising gives you the opportunity to fix all these different things. And, and it's never going to be perfect. Um, but, 
you know, you, you just do the best you can. And like my philosophy is like every book gives me an opportunity to write a book that's even better than the one before it. It may not mean as many awards. It may not sell as much. It may be totally different. But my goal is for every book to be better. Yeah, agreed. Um, Don, did you did you want to add anything? Oh wait, or did we start with Don? We <laughs> and your and your process. Well, we're we're almost out of time here, and there was one question that I did want to ask, and it it really has to do with the role of publishers, literary agents, and even authors and illustrators in um, increasing the pipeline, so that we can have more authors and illustrators. And, I, and so I'm curious, what do you think can be done to, to improve the pipeline to get more authors and illustrators that look like you guys into this work? Um, Varian, since we're looking at you, why don't you quickly just give me a quick little, what, what's one thing that you think could be done to help? Um, I, oh, there's a lot of different things and it depends on where you are in the kind of the chain of things. I will say, um, um, I, I will say this as, you know, I'll say this as, as, as a writer, right? Uh, and I'll take this for, for twins. Like, I was very specific with twins. I wanted a Black illustrator. Not only did I want a Black illustrator, I wanted a Black woman illustrating this book. And I was lucky enough to have um, uh, enough of a pull to, to be able to say that to the publisher and we all agreed. And every author can't do that. But you know what? Sometimes you can ask. Sometimes you can request. I don't think there's any shame with saying, hey, I really envision this being oh, yeah, created by this person of color. Um, I, think, I think this is, I, I think, oh, I hear somebody talking. Um, uh, I really encourage uh, authors to think about that when they're creating the books. I know the rules that you can't always ask, but I think that leads to some biased thinking sometimes. And maybe you should drop a nugget in there. Thank you so much. Um, uh Jerry, uh, and then Don, and then um, Gordon. Uh, what do you think can be done so that we can see more panels like this with more uh, brothers doing this work? I mean, I think, like I said, um, if there was a silver lining at all in 2020, it's that the world finally realized that um, it's, it's great to share the space and learn about people because if you don't learn about them, then, then the natural reaction is fear, you know? So when you sit down and talk to Gordon or Barry and Don or myself or you, it's like, oh, wow, you know, these guys are accomplished. They've done this, they've done that. You share the stories, you know, you know, I want to put in new kids, the microaggressions, like there's nothing big that happens. There's no like, school shooting or someone dies or anything like that but just to show when they talk about death by a thousand paper cuts like on a daily basis it's just poke 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 you know and all these things that happen of you know maybe varying goes someplace and they think that he's gordon or they think that he's Doc. like those <laughs> things happen yeah. you know and i just want to show <laughs> that on a daily uh, basis i mean i went to a, a school one time doing a, an office signing and the woman was like, oh, great. And she thought I was there to fix the copier. So she took me to the copy room, you know? And it's not something that people think because they think, oh, well, if I don't do this, you know, I'm not insensitive, but you don't realize all these little things, you know? And those are the kind of things that I think having our books in the limelight and also having panels like this kind of open up the conversation and an actual dialogue, which people don't do, anymore because they're too busy shouting over each other. Uh, thank you. Uh, Don, uh, what, what do you think uh, in terms of what can be done to create more uh, opportunity for, for men of color, black men to write? Um, oh, that's such a big question. I was kind of stunned there for a second, but I think about, you know, the work that like Jerry's doing um, with New Kid and Class Act and those books you know, they, they were New York Times bestsellers and they won the Newberry and they won the Kirkus. And publishers noticed that, you know, um, and that's going to open up doors for other African-American creators. When we come to a, an agent with our works, they're going to remember 
that these books featuring African-American characters, they do sell. It's not true that Black kids don't read. And that's been proved through the work that Jerry does. It's been proved through the work that Gordon and, and, and Derek and, and Varian do. And um, so, yeah, that's just All continuing right. to do, continuing to produce wonderful award-winning works. Beautiful, wonderful. And Gordon, we'll wrap things up with you. Um, uh, look, Alvin. Uh, oh wait, yep. Alvin Jamar, I just want to interject for a moment. We've almost exhausted our time, but there is a ten-year-old um, author here named Tiana, and I believe that she wants to address you all really quick. If that's okay. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and aunt mute her. Hi. Diana, are you there? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Diana. Um, so I had asked this question earlier, but I guess I can ask it again now. Um, so my name is Tiana Sermons, and I'm a 10-year-old reporter here in Delaware. And I'm writing my first children's book. I have the title, characters, beginning, ending, but no plot. What advice would you have on developing a plot? Okay, I'm going to start first because um, I actually have some thoughts on this. Um, I think you have to think about, you, you might have a plot. Maybe you just don't see it yet. But here's the thing. We, we always want to start a book on the day that things are different for a character. We don't need to know how everything's the same. We need to know when things change. And then we need to figure out what that character wants and what's getting in the way of the character. And that's going to help you create your plot as they're trying to think about what they, this thing they want, whether it's this physical thing, like to um, uh, train and run the race and win the race, or it could be this emotional thing to reconnect with their parent. It could be something that's tied together, but you're going to think about the thing that the character wants and the character needs and what's getting in their way. And as they try harder and harder to get that thing, the odds are going to be harder and harder for them to overcome until they finally do. And then how do they change from that? And it, it takes a while. So you, you, you're not going to know it in the first draft, maybe the second or third. You revise and you revise and revise. But just keep thinking about what that character wants and what's stopping them from getting what they want. That's the easiest way, I think, to kind of create plot. But I will also add, Technically, every book doesn't have to have a plot. It helps to have one, but you know, there are plenty of books that don't have plot. And it doesn't have to be Harry Potter. You don't have to have this magnus opus. It could be just as something as simple as you can't wait to have your favorite scoop of ice cream when you get home from school. Yeah. You know, and just what's going on with that. Like it doesn't have to be like gigantic. It could be very simple. Well, thank you for that really great question. And uh, thank all of you authors and, and illustrators for um, participating in this panel. I feel very honored um, to have an opportunity to uh, participate in this conversation and to moderate uh, such a distinguished uh, panel. And, you know, I look forward to uh, meeting all of you all at conferences or festivals or wherever else after. Rona decides to go sit down somewhere. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, again, uh, I just want to tell everybody listening uh, to just continue reading these authors' books, keep promoting uh, their work and the work of, of, of other authors who are out here pressing the envelope and, and moving things forward for the publishing industry and for all those future authors that are going to be following uh, behind them. Um, and I can't wait to, to continue to find more and different ways for the work that we're doing with Barbershop Books uh, to intersect with you guys. So uh, I, uh, that is, concludes our panel uh, for today. Uh, and I want to make sure I give a, a big thank you to the Wilmington Public Library, uh, the sponsors uh, of this event uh, for making this, this possible. Um, and stay safe everyone wear your mask and and lastly uh like i say we're trying to encourage literacy in our community especially in wilmington delaware so if there is a book uh, any any book of your choice by any of the authors on the panel if you message us we will mail you a free copy look at that so <laughs> uh 
That's nice. Y'all better reach out and get them books. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, um, Jamar, is there anything else that you would like to say? That's it. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Continue to be well and, and safe. Bye, right, everyone. Bye, everyone. Y'all be safe. Bye, Thank you.